This is Joseph. I'll be presenting a wealth of industry knowledge from interviews with successful business people and our own state-of-the-art research. Your time is valuable, so let's go. Good to have you here. This is the first in a series of glossary episodes where we'll be looking at some terminology used in the world of e-commerce. As someone who's been a customer, a business owner, an employee for others, as well as for myself, I'm also going to be providing you with my perspective on them. We know how granular these things can get. So for this first episode, a lot of these terms are going to be rather broad in scope, so much so that it's not worth elaborating in this episode because we elaborate on entire episodes. You'll, you'll understand once we start getting into these. For those of you with an advanced knowledge, you'll probably already know these, and to a greater extent than myself. So I can say two things to you. One is that as an expert in my field, I still consume 101 level media, just in case there's something I missed, I uh, thought I understood, and it turns out I misunderstood it or if I just want to hear a fresh perspective. The second is that I have a fresh perspective. So I'll also weigh in on these from my own experience, and hopefully there's a takeaway in there for you. Starting as broad as we possibly can, we have e-commerce. Or electronic commerce. It means any platform on the internet that provides a good or service. I'm going to give you a minute to absorb that. Okay, you're good. Next up, we have drop shipping. Many of you know this quite well, and on the show, we'll be going into it in great depths. As with e-commerce, which is not necessarily this episode, dropshipping is a business model where a consumer purchases a product online, which is then purchased by the seller from a third-party location. So you will see lots of businesses, and you've probably bought something from them, I know I have, where they don't have a warehouse. They have contact with a warehouse, and so when you order from them, they order from the warehouse. Presumably it's a warehouse. It does depend on volume, but I'm pretty sure it's a warehouse. Okay, let's move on. We have just-in-time manufacturing, also known as the just-in-time inventory system. This is a process by which manufacturers try to align the supply they make with the demand for them. In contrast to this is a just-in-case system where producers make a broad scope prediction of how much they'll need and then manufacture based off that. We're going to want to keep this in mind as we compare different business models, especially comparing dropshipping to uh, other forms. Next one, we have retail arbitrage. This is a method where sellers purchase products, usually at a reduced price in stores, and then sell it online at a markup. Again, this is something that we can relate to when we start uh, learning and talking more about e-commerce and dropshipping as a whole. I do want to say I do remember... One personal experience with somebody who was uh, doing retail arbitrage in the classic sense, one of the, my seasonal jobs was at a toy warehouse, just, you know, moving boxes around, helping kids and uh, parents and all that good stuff. And I saw somebody going around making a list of the different products that he wanted to buy in bulk. And his job was to buy them in bulk and then sell them at a markup. Where? I don't know. But what I can say is that our toy warehouse only had so much exposure, so chances are he was going to sell it to a community that otherwise wasn't being served. Next up, we have PUR. Now, if you see PUR, you're either looking at a brand of water or an instance of PUR, which stands for purchase. In order to purchase something, you have to have ATC, which is add to cart. Pretty self-explanatory. You know what's funny to me is the concept of saying add to cart. It's ubiquitous with the idea of getting products, putting them somewhere until you're ready to buy them. It's like temporary ownership. Next up, we have add to cart. Again, pretty self-explanatory. What's funny to me is, you know how the save button is at times still the image of a floppy disk, but no one's used a floppy disk in more than 20 years? Well, I'm not saying that we're going to get to a point where there are no shopping carts and nobody does any shop anymore. We could. I'm not going to rule it out completely. But what I find funny is that now when we say add to cart, 
we are using the concept of a cart in situations where there actually isn't one. Not, not a physical one, just a virtual one. Anyways, in addition to ATC, there is also CPATC, the cost per add to cart. Uh, we'll find a lot of these terms fit into a bigger picture as they work in tandem with other terms. Next we have BEP, which stands for break even point, or as I like to call it, <sighs> this is the amount of money you need to earn to be in a stable position. You got out of losses, so congratulations. All right, next up is CPC, cost per click. Now, I can weigh in on this a little bit from an earlier point in my life. When I had first launched a uh, webcomic of mine, I was trying to come up with different ways to promote it, and one of them was to use Google Ads. I found it to be a pretty fair system. Uh, not that I made any headway on, uh, on, on it, but it's my own inefficiency. It didn't have anything to do with CPC. Here's how it works. It lets you, the advertiser, decide how much money you're willing to pay in order to secure someone's click. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to buy anything, or in some cases that it's even a person. But what it does allow is for you to have some slice of the pie. Let's say you and I are both selling a product, and there are a lot of things in common. Maybe it's even the exact same product, and we even have the same supplier. Now, if I'm willing to pay $0.10 cents per click and you're willing to pay $600, well, your ad's going to be displayed first. If your daily budget is $1,800, that means you'll have three clicks that day before I get to have mine displayed. 600 is an absurd amount of money for this comparison, but basically, the more money you're willing to spend, the longer your ad can be displayed. Once the ad is up, it could be up for hours, depending on traffic. So in that sense, you're paying a premium on exposure. What's great about this system is that it gives everyone a fair chance, but it does also favor whomever has more to spend. Which it should. Next up you have CTR, that is click-through rate. Your click-through rate helps you understand how many people are seeing your ad versus how many people are clicking on it. To have a good click-through rate, you're depending on good ad copy to draw attention to it. Because chances are your ad isn't the only ad that's going to be on screen. All right, next up is CPP, cost per purchase. CPP stands for cost per purchase. And just so we can keep things official on this one, I'm going to tell you what it says on Facebook. This metric is calculated as total amount spent divided by purchases. Okay, well, then I looked at the definition of amount spent. The estimated total amount of money you've spent on your campaign, ad set, or ad during its schedule. Amount spent lets you see how much you've spent against your maximum budget during the time period you're looking at. It may include amounts already invoiced as well as billable amounts that haven't been invoiced yet. This metric is used as the numerator for calculating all cost per action or cost per result metrics. If your ads are currently running, these numbers may be an estimate since it can take up to 48 hours for ad results to be processed. That was all taken from Facebook, just want you to know. Now, if you had asked me if CPP involves all facets of business, I'd have said yes. Overhead, cost of product, staff, taxes, uh, all of that is arguably all true. However, in the context of Facebook business, it seems to only value the money spent on advertising that has led to sales. So how do we parse this information? The amount of money we need customers to spend on the product is a result of cost. Anything standing in the way of the product being on sale. So that means manufacturing, labor, and distribution, but not necessarily shipping, since people are all over the world, and that's an inconsistent variable. At one of my jobs, we had to rent a Tesla to drop a product off at the customer's house, since FedEx didn't cover shipping to that area. Pretty smooth ride, I was told. I was, I was on the phones that day. Now, CPP in this context doesn't have anything to do with the product cost. What it has to do is with advertising. And now we might ask, isn't advertising cost? Well, in a sense that a brick and mortar store needs to put up a sign and that sign should look appealing, then yes. But advertising is more nuanced than that. We advertise in order to draw attention to our product, but we also use it as a form of investment and retention. We can use it to show solidarity with modern issues, such as all the companies that are letting you know they're aware of COVID-19, we can use it to retain trust in customers by reaffirming them after they're purchased, 
by reaffirming them after they purchased. We can use it to send a message about what our brand means to us. We can use it as promotion. And of course, we depend on it to let customers know the product exists and is for sale. But it's not essential in the same way that the product itself is essential. This is why marketing and advertising requires its own budget and its own strategy. And that's why we want to track it separately. All right, now we got CPM, cost per thousand or cost per mile. Cost per mile is a colloquial term. It's supposed to mean cost per thousand. As you can guess, this is more critical to scaling an operation. But if you're using dropshipping, it's likely that you will be scaling. So this will be an important metric to deploy at that time. There's also cost per minute. So just keep that in mind based on context. I, I think you'll know which one is which. As with CPP, this also is referencing the cost for advertised to 1,000 people. And then you have ROAS, Return on Advertising Spending. This is a metric to figure out what your revenue is based on your ads. It's not the same thing as ROI, Return on Investment, which determines your profit, so two different margins. All right, and then you have PURCC. So we know it's purchase, custom conversion. This is a Facebook tool you can use to optimize your advertising. If I'm selling instruments, what I can do is set a custom rule to find out of those sales, how many are of a certain demographic, such as gender, as well as how many of them spent over a certain amount of money. From that kind of key detail, it helps me fine tune my advertisements to sell more effectively to that target audience. Next up is CBO, Campaign Based Optimization. CBO on Facebook is a three-step process to refine your advertising strategy. You have your campaign, which is your objective, which may be to sell cat food. Within your campaign, you have ad sets, a collection of advertisements that have something in common, such as geography or budget. And then within each ad set are the advertisements, the creative copy that the customers will see. As with any term that involves detail and specificity, CBO is critical to the success of your business. As you're not just competing with other ads, but you're competing with the customer's willingness to pay attention. Next up, we have a carousel ad. I'm confident that you've seen one of these already. A carousel ad lets the seller use up to 10 images in a space that customers can scroll through. It can be used to sell one product, but shown in multiple ways. It can be used to show a variety of products if your store is more general, like if it were a general store. It also allows for a narrative if each image leads into the next. I haven't seen one myself, but I imagine a comic book art style would be a great fit. So from image one to image 10, there is a narrative through line through it, or there could be. All right, now we have DPA, Dynamic Product Ad. Uh, I got a quote for you I wanted to read from adespresso.com. I, I found it rather eye-opening. In a world overrun by advertising, consumers are becoming immune or actively taking steps to replace ads altogether. That's why the average banner ad click-through rate is 0.1%, end quote. Advertising has two challenges. Step two, sell the product. Step one, sell the ad. DPA's job is to help the seller refine their advertising so they can better tailor what they're selling to whom. As I read on with research, the key takeaway is the more assets you have, the easier it is to set up a successful DPA. But the smaller your business or the less products you're selling, all the way to selling literally one product, the less there is that can be dynamic. Let's say I'm running a clothing store. If I'm basically selling a couple of articles of clothing, I need to cater a target market around those clothes. But let's say I sell hundreds of different kinds of clothing, hats, shoes, pants, masks. A dynamic product ad has already filtered through the data I've accumulated and can make sure I'm showing the right product to the right person. All right, next up, we have upsell, downsell, and cross-sell. Upselling is when you try to get customers to purchase a more expensive version of what they were interested in. Downselling is, well, you know, the opposite. And cross-selling, now this is interesting to me because when I worked in brick-and-mortar sales environments, I did cross-selling thinking it was upselling. Somebody wants to buy a watch, by the time they had reached checkout, uh, part of my job was to offer them a polishing cloth, extra bands, a purse. And I thought that all counted as upselling. Well, I was wrong. 
e-commerce platforms will attempt to use these tactics, and I mean that in a pragmatic sense, to make sure simply that if a customer is going to spend the money, that the money is well spent. Again, using my watch analogy, which totally isn't based off real experience. Someone might be interested in a watch, but are about to pay extra money for features that are of no use to them. Whereas I know the product by virtue of standing there for hours, and I know there's a model similar in every way, except it's lower in price because it doesn't have those features. Of course, sometimes I had to do this in hushed tones because if my floor manager hears me talking someone into spending less money, there's going to be trouble. So on that note, I would uh, defer judgment to whoever has the most contact with the person. Back to e-commerce. With any successful business intent on scaling, having individual sales agents can lack a certain effectiveness. So using modernity to our advantage, we can tell when a customer should be enticed one way or another based off what they do. If they click away, try a downsell. If they add to cart, show them what else they might like. If they get something low cost, make sure they see the other offers in case those offers end up being better value. And above all else, look out for their best interest. I've been a buyer for a long time. I remember when I was under pressure and when I felt like that pressure wasn't justified. I'm not going to forget about that kind of thing. One other thing I want to weigh in on is what role does a sales agent have if the process is automated? Well, I learned on my first day in sales from the best seller in the store at the time, the product sells itself. Our job as sales agents is to validate the customer's mind that was probably already made up, and then to make sure that they're having a quality experience and are spending their money wisely. If you work for someone who is unironically saying, sell, 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 it's because they're under pressure. Someone else is telling them the same thing, and so on and so on. The best sales jobs I ever had were the ones where there was the least amount of pressure on me to close, where I could just talk to customers as people and leave them with a positive feeling. Even if they didn't spend the money that day, the chances of them coming back increased tenfold. Next up is LLA, lookalike audience. An LLA is a Facebook tool that can take information you have of your current audience and turn cold leads into potential buyers. As we, and I well know, Facebook collects your data, and then businesses use that data to figure out who they can market the product to. Finding an audience is tough to begin with, but using LLA helps turn your audience into a resource to help find similar people. I always try to think of this as, okay, how is this going to do good? But let's say you have a community built around your brand. If you use LLA to draw more people in, then the community expands. If you know your product is marketed to people who are busy or stressed, by doing the legwork of figuring their needs out, you can reach out to them in specific to resolve their needs and save them time. If you believe your product is doing good in the world, and you should, then it makes sense to try to find all the people it can do good for. It's up to you, the seller, to decide how specific the details for the audience are. If you refine the details, you'll attract less people, but the people you do attract are likelier to be in line to buy. If you go broad, you'll attract a lot of people, but they're less likely to turn warm. One way I look at this is if I'm running a successful business and I want to open a second location, a lookalike audience would have the same commonality as the people in a mall. Depending on which mall I go to, the people there will have different things in common. As we want to make good strategic choices as to where we open up shop, we also want to find the right balance between reaching out to people while also drawing them in. All right, now we got SKAG, Single Keyword Ad Group, also referred to as SCAG. Specificity is a powerful ally. The difference between someone looking for a mahogany shoe versus a dark brown shoe can mean the difference between thousands of sales. The kind of specificity we're talking about here is hard to quantify, but I'll try. I could say a magazine with a niche interest would attract advertisers looking to target that particular market might be along these lines. It's The Economist over time, uh, and then Gold Monthly over The Economist, and then Golden Teeth Implants Monthly over Gold Monthly. The point is, it's specific. Now, while it does say single keyword ad group, it doesn't actually have to be one word. In fact, it probably won't work if it is. Ideally, it's several words grouped together. 
This method is used to target customers who already know what they want to a fine degree, and you want to make sure their needs are met by you. To pull this off well, you need a website that's optimized and is consistent with the specificity you've been using. So if someone is looking for lime green paint, when they reach the landing page, don't suddenly have a list of colors and make them take the time to find that exact color. Also, I, sh I should mention what a landing page is. It's when somebody clicks a link, a landing page is where the link takes them. So uh, that's a bonus definition. This is not recommended as a one-size-fits-all approach to e-commerce, but it is for when you are very confident in your brand and target market, and you can write copy with razor precision. All right, I got one more to talk about today. Uh, and it's also the one I have a significant amount of experience in, VA, a virtual assistant. It's the year 2020, and many of us have been confined to our homes for an indescribable amount of time. Some of us, myself included, were practicing social distancing and working remote way before we were required to. My generation, the millennial, okay, I guess Generation X might claim this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it. The millennial is the first to fully mesh the online world with our world around us, and there's no going back. With that said, I want to take a moment and express my sympathy for all the people who've lost their jobs and their businesses and all of this. Not to mention that there have been much worse losses than that. I've done my fair share of physical labor, uh, and I spent 10 years pursuing podcasting and media. And while I've done the work, I do consider myself very lucky to be where I am right now. I have great compassion, but more so, I also have faith in the human race. As difficult as these times are, each of us have the capacity to take care of ourselves and those in need. We are a great bunch of people. We've come really far, and I'm, for one, I'm proud of us. All right, now with that said, virtual assistant is a new way to work, and it might be right up your alley. According to CanadiansInternet.com, a virtual assistant works for a company, either as a freelancer or as an employee, in their own environment, not in a centralized office. If you're running an online business, whether it's e-com or... I can't really think of any other examples at the moment. Huh. Well, you will very likely need a VA for customer service uh, or for bookkeeping or research, copywriting. And in fairness, I technically am one as well, since I'm working from home. I've also done VA work as a freelancer for a number of clients as an audio editor, uh, but I've also been employed virtually as a customer success agent. If you, and I don't mean if because you probably did, notice a little speech bubble in the bottom right corner of the screen on some of the sites you've been visiting, some of them will have a person you can talk to. Others will have an AI that helps you navigate through your issue by searching their database. And some use a mix. Once in a while, <laughs> so at, uh, at, the, at the job where I was doing that, um, it was funny because sometimes somebody would thank me for being a person to talk to rather than an AI. And my bit was, oh, sorry for the confusion, sir. I actually am an AI. The technology has come a long way. That, that worked out. People like that one. If you want to use it, go ahead, but you have to do a good job first. Being a customer service representative online is a great job because it's easy to be efficient. We used Intercom, which would show me messages as they came in, and my job was to answer them as quickly and as effectively as I could. I was able to be more productive over time because when I would get a similar question, I had a list of answers on a Google Doc that I would copy, paste, edit for context, and send. And to draw a comparison from even further back, I suppose that when I was doing sales on the floor, somebody would ask me a question, I would say an answer that I had already said uh, numerous times before. The challenge was to re-say it and make it sound like it was new for the first time. So copy and pasting was a little bit more efficient. But uh, my point here with uh, copy and pasting is that it goes to show that anything can become an asset with a little ingenuity and a willingness to spend extra time in the present to save time later. Once a business scales, however, uh, what I found is the higher the scale, the more likely the position will be handled by AI. Um, so one example you can see of this is AliExpress. Because there's so much business going on, what will happen is if I'm going to 
need to work on work out an issue with customer service, the AI bot will ask me some questions and then I'll click on the answer that's most relevant. I can also say that depending on the company, being a CSA uh, can involve a lot of improvisation and quick thinking, and not all the solutions are present. And also, unlike in an office building where I can pop over the cubicle and bother Patrick, when I'm working virtually and I'm at home, the work can actually feel rather isolating. So there are some downsides to this, and that, and that is one of them. Um, and there is another thing that I, I do want to warn people about if people decide to become a virtual assistant. Overall, I think the positives outweigh the negatives. But this is something for people to keep in mind, as well as for companies to keep in mind when they hire people, is that while work and life, okay, well, I mean, work is a part of life, but you know, the, the part of life that's not your shift work, I'm sure you understand what I was going for. While it can be blended in a new and efficient way, it can also mean stress takes on a new form as well. When we work from home, it can be difficult to compartmentalize the stress of work because it's now manifested where we live and are arguably at our most vulnerable. A bad day at the office at least stays at the office. The way I resolve this is that I've got my bedroom and I've got my office. My bedroom has no devices in there. Well, I, okay, actually, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm in my bedroom right now, but the acoustics were better than my office. You know, as soon as I'm done, everything's out. Uh, my office, on the other hand, has so much Wi-Fi darting around that I should be wearing a hazmat suit. Also, the, the quick side, side tip, uh, what I've been doing for the last couple of weeks is that I noticed that if I get up and my phone is right there, it'll be the first thing I do to grab my phone. So now my phone is uh, on the other side of my home whenever I get up in the morning. Anyways, because things can get stressful... I recommend making sure that your work is done in its own environment. Um, now, if you don't have that luxury, I hope that you can make it to that point because it's worth it. And one other recommendation I want to make is that after you're done your shift, one thing that's very helpful for your well-being is to go for a walk. That way, when you get back, you can have a renewed feeling and it mimics the sense of coming home from a day of work. Plus, you probably save, like, what, an hour in commuting time? So use that time to get some exercise in, won't you? <sighs> All right. Well, that was round one. There is plenty more where that came from. So if there's a term that you either don't know at all, I mean, I guess you can, you can probably look it up, but you can let us know anyways, so maybe we can weigh in on it with our expertise. Otherwise, if you have any feedback, you can always let us know podcast at debutify.com hopefully this was refreshing for you hopefully you learned something new hopefully you've got a good takeaway whatever the case is you're welcome to let us know you might have found this show on any number of platforms apple podcasts spotify google play stitcher or right here on debutify whatever the case if you enjoy this content and want to help us thrive please take a few moments to leave a review on apple podcasts or wherever you think is best we also want to hear from you, so whether you think you'd be a good guest or want to weigh in on anything related to our show, you can email podcast at debutify.com or connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Finally, this podcast is created by the passionate team at Debutify. If you're ready to take the plunge into e-commerce or are looking to up your game, head over to debutify.com and see how it can change your life and the lives of many through what you do next.